or dt. Sure, but what's it mean? A change in the radius over time. The, the, how the radius is changing with respect to time. Does that make sense? It will either be growing or falling, depending on whether we're putting water in or taking water out. Uh, but the, the radius will be growing or, or shrinking. So we need to know the rate at which it's changing for a moment of time. We need to know that. That will tell us how the volume is changing in a moment of time. We would also need to know dhdt. What's dhdt stand for? Yeah, how the height of our water is changing with respect to time. Is it going up? Is it going down? What's happening to that? We need to know all of those pieces. What the radius is currently. What the height is currently. That would give us the actual volume. But to associate how the volume is changing, that's where we need the change in the radius and the change in the height. Help people kind of understand the concept of our, our, D8, our uh, related rates. Now, we're going to go a little step backwards and kind of start simply, and we're going to build up to problems like this. Are you ready for it? But if you understand this, you understand the concept. So let's start off real simple. I'm not even going to give you any, any background on this. I'm just going to say here's an equation. dy dt, and here's what this implies, it implies that y and x are both functions in terms of t, just like this was. Okay, it implies that y is changing according to time and x is changing according to time. Are you with me on this? So they're functions in terms of t. At t equals 1. Why don't you go ahead and do this real quick for me? Take an implicit derivative, because this has to be implicit. Y and X are in terms of T right now. It's got to be implicit. Take an implicit derivative with respect to T right now for me. There's no hard product rule. There's nothing about this. So d dt of y equals d dt of x cubed. Notice we're, we're taking to respect to t because we want to figure out what happens here at dy dt and at t equals 1. So uh, what's this side going to become for you? <coughs> On the right-hand side, I get 3x squared, right? And that's it? Dx dt. Why dx dt? Look at it. Look at, I know we have an x up here, but are you taking it with respect to x? No, you're not. You're taking it with respect to t, implying that x is a function of t. So unless there's an x there, you have to have something after that. Just like we had a dx of y, we had to have that dy dx, right? It was in terms of x. So this says, I need a dx dt. Show of hands how people have that. Good, you understand the implicit form of this, and that's what that means. So let's go ahead and let's figure out what happens at t equals 1. Oh, crap. Where do I plug in the t? Is there a t to plug in? By the way, you can't plug in. can't plug that in. <laughs> D1. <laughs> I sunk your battleship. That's what that means. Uh, no, there's... Did you get it? That was funny. Uh, no, there's no, there's no t to plug in. So if I give this problem to you, I have to give you more things. I have to give you stuff. I would have had to give you all this stuff, right? It has to be given somewhere in the problem. So here's what I'm going to say. Find this out if if x equals 2 and dx dt equals 4 at t equals 1. At t equals 1. Note something, please. x and dx dt will change for certain times. So at t equals 2, this will no longer be the case. But look what I've given you. I said find it at t equals 1. Oh, what's happening at t equals 1? I've also given you that information. Does that make sense to you? So I've given, it matches up. I've given you the piece for that. So why does it say t equals 1 and t equals 1? It says find this at t equals 1, yes. But then I have to tell you what happens at t equals 1. I can't just give these to you unless I define t equals 1 either because those things will change for other times. 
Now do you have enough information to plug this in? You've got an x, you've got an x. You've got dx dt, ah, I have the rate of change of x according to time. That means you can plug in the numbers and figure this out. So this would be... What is it? 48 units according to whatever time, like seconds or hours, according to whatever t is. What does this mean? This means that y is changing at a rate of 48 whatevers per unit of time. That's what that says. You okay with this? Cool. All right. Let's intensify the problem just a little bit. So next thing we're going to talk about. Have you guys ever heard of the Exxon Valdez? Yes. What did it do? Yeah, oh, oil spill. Oil yeah, and oil is crazy, right? Because it usually sticks on the surface of water and just starts expanding. Just keeps on expanding. Now we're going to do kind of a simplified problem. You see in the ocean there's, there's current and there's drift and there's waves and stuff. We're going to do a simplified Exxon Valdez. What we're going to say is that this, this small, it's a small tank here, so I can be, we're simplifying the problem here. Uh, it started leaking oil, and what it's going to do is give us a radius that's spreading at a certain rate. Uh, we want to find out how fast the area is increasing at a certain radius. So we want to be able to calculate, model, uh, what the, the surface area of this, this oil spill is actually going to be. Do you understand the, the question here? So we'll, let me write this out for you real quick. Oh, by the way, any questions on this one? <laughs> Too late. Oil spill. Here's what we know. Radius is spreading at a constant three feet per second. This is one of two cases because naturally, if you think about an oil spill, the radius should actually slow down, right? I mean, because that area is getting massive after a certain amount of time, so the radius should actually slow down spreading. So one of two things is happening: either this is for a very small oil spill right at the beginning, or for a certain segment of time, which that could be the case, or an instant of time, or the oil is pumping out more and more and more and more. Okay, so you start with a little spill and then you get more. But in, in, in any case, we're saying the radius of this circle of oil is a constantly, it, the radius is growing constantly. Okay, so a constant three feet per second. Do you see why that would probably not be realistic unless you have a massive amount of oil that starts real small and then really grows? Do you see that? Because, I mean, three feet a second, like here's your, your first circle and then after one second, uh, it is now three feet more, so can't even do that. Okay, big. And after another second. So probably over a certain segment of time. What we want to know is how fast is the area increasing when the radius is 30 feet? How fast is radius increasing when, I'm sorry, how fast is the area increasing when the radius is 30? Here's what you do first. Number one, you assign some letters to take care of these things. So, firstly, we need this according to time, so we're going to pick T for time. <coughs> what other things do we need to know about, about this? Area. What else? Area. So let's pick A for area. Okay. What else do we need to know about this? Radius. Well, that's our ultimate question, right? But I mean just the variables that we're dealing with. Radius. We have a radius, so R for radius. So the first part really shouldn't be that big of a deal. Just pick out some 
some letters. So T is going to be your time. In our case, we only have two of the things that are happening. We have a radius and we have an area. That's it. Are you guys okay with the letters? Next thing you got to do after you assign your letters, identify the formula that you're doing. So this is step one. Step one is pick your letters. Step two is you got to identify what formula you're dealing with. And it should be given up there somewhere. It should have some relationship that relates all of your letters or everything except for T. It should have that. So what are we talking about here that's going to relate our area and our radius? That's what we really want to do. Because the T is going to take care of itself when we find a derivative. We want to relate an area and a radius. Can you find, think of a formula that relates to that? Yeah, it's a circle, right? It's a circle. So in this case, our formula is not very hard. It just says, can you relate everything up here? And that's the idea of a related rate. It says, relate these, these items I want to compare. And so for us, sure, I have an area and a radius. Let's relate the area of a circle and the radius. Well, that just says area equals pi r squared. That's what we're talking about. You okay with this so far? Now, dA dt is going to come about this, but that's what we're asking. Uh, how fast is the area increasing? That's going to be this dA dt. What else are we going to get up here? Do you see the dr dt coming about? So every variable you're going to get that. dA dt is the rate of change of area according to time, of course. And we're also going to get a dr dt. Now, your problem is not going to give you specifically what DRDT is. And I can say DRDT is this, but it would be worded in such a way that you should be able to understand it. What does DRDT mean? Change in the radius. Good, good. It means a change in radius. A D, whatever, that's the change in, the change in radius. By the way, um, do you know what dr dt is going to equal for our specific problem right here? It should say in the word problem. This says the rate of change of the radius. What's the rate of change, the rate of change of our radius? Is it 30? No. That is the radius. What is the rate of change of the radius? It should be how the radius is changing. I'll put up there somewhere. It says the radius is spreading. Oh, it's changing at a constant of 3 feet a second. So our radius here is changing at a rate of 3 feet per second. Do you understand how to get the dr dt and, and, and identify that that's 3 in this case? So it says the rate is changing. Hey, that's a rate of change. That's what we're talking about. Now, after this, we're almost done. The only thing that we've got to do now, step number 3. Take a derivative with respect to time, implicitly, because they're all functions of time. And then lastly, plug in the values and you'll have it. So here's what we're going to do. We'll do it very quickly. We're going to take d dt of a. We're going to take d dt, function of time, of pi r squared. There's no tricky rules involved here. This is going to be d a dt. On the right-hand side, we have 2 pi r dr dt. Do you see where we're getting the 2 pi r? Mm -hmm. Explain to me why I don't have a product rule between my pi and my r. Why not? Yeah. Pi is actually not a variable. Yeah, it's constant. So this says bring down the 2. Great. Subtract 1 from the exponent. Got it. But I need a dr dt. Do you see why I need a dr dt? I've got to be able to incorporate this information 